Baruch Hashem. I'm recording part two of our Songs of the Bible series. The video from class, it didn't record the last half, so we're picking up from page, um, we're going to pick up from page 17. And if you're following on the blog, that will be at a section of a couple of scriptures beginning with Tehillim, Psalm 51 and verse 9 through 12. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. And Devarine, Deuteronomy 32, 21. This would be back into our song of Moshe. They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols, so I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. When God brings his staff of consequence over his people. It is often through alien nations who come in and oppress them, take their land, exile them, destroy the infrastructure and system that was meant to be built up for his honor and service, not so that they could do whatever they please with their resources. So often, through these wars and invading nations, he will cut off all those resources they took for granted, food, water, health, and security. And back to our song, Devarim, Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a fire is kindled in my anger, and it burns to the lowest parts of Sheol, and consumes the earth with its yield, and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap misfortunes on them. I will use my arrows on them. I wanted to attempt to understand what it is these arrows of God are. Again, bearing in mind this is poetry, and always potentially metaphoric. In Psalm 64, the words of evildoers are their arrows. When you think about it in terms of weaponry, we are told elsewhere the sword is the word of God. So it makes sense that a bow and arrow could also be related. Hashem speaks in Hosea of slaying by the word of his mouth. And the prophet Yeshayahu Isaiah describes himself as a weapon of the Lord, both sword and arrow in that message is related through the prophet's words, and sometimes that message is something that the people do not want to hear, will condemn the people, will break the heart of a person. Let us take this in and understand what Hashem may be saying when he relates, I will use my arrows on them. Tehillim Psalm 64, 2 through 9. Hide me from the secret counsel of evildoers, from the tumult of those who do iniquity who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aimed bitter speech as their arrow, to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him, and do not fear. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who can see them? They devise injustices, saying, we are ready with a well-conceived plot, for the inward thought and the heart of a man are deep. But God will shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be wounded, so they will make him stumble. Their own tongue is against them. All who see them will shake the head. Then all men will fear, and they will declare the work of God, and will consider what he has done. Hosea 6.5 Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgments go forth like lightning. Yeshayahu Isaiah 49 and verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me like a polished arrow. He hid me in his quiver. I believe this next section of the Song of Moshe relates to the preceding verse regarding the arrows of the Lord being used upon them. If we are tying the arrows of the Lord to his words, going forth, somewhat like the prophet's message, 
hitting the mark and either causing the death of a man who is ready to repent and become reborn through the forgiveness of sins or hitting the mark for condemnation in that the rebellious man continues to sin despite the warning and is charged through the fact that he knew what the word warned regarding his behavior and the consequences thereof and he continued in his perverted and senseless path. That being said, before we get into the next section, I want to show you a passage where God promises the special protection, all the goodness in life, provision, and abundance when his people hold fast to his Torah. These promises have to do with a contrast to the life they knew of and witnessed in Egypt during their bondage and the period of the plagues before the Exodus. So Shemot, Exodus fifteen twenty six, And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. And Devarim, Deuteronomy seven twelve through 15 then it shall come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep you with His keep with you His covenant and His loving kindness, which He swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock, in the land which He swore to your forefathers to give you. You. you shall be blessed above all the peoples. There will be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. The Lord will remove from you all sickness, and he will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but he will lay them on all who hate you. Now, with that, I want you to visualize while reading the relation to the curses which come upon this people when they continue continually on this perverse path to that which was experienced in Egypt prior to the Exodus. So here we have a section of our song, Devarim 32, 24-25. They will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction, and the teeth of beasts I will send upon them with the venom of crawling things of the dust. Outside the sword will bereave. Inside terror, both young man and virgin, the nursling with the man of gray hair. And now, Shemot, Exodus 11, 4 through 6. Thus saith the Lord God. Moshe said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight, and going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of the Paro who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before, and such as there shall never be again. I included this passage from Shemot 11 toward the end of the plagues because to me it linked with verse 25 of the Song of Moshe. The destruction was not prejudiced, it affected everyone. The decimation of the crops in Egypt, as in Israel, would lead to famine, wild beasts, and plague from biting, stinging things of the dust, the kiln ash, and gnats upon the people of Egypt. The bottom line is that the very things they witnessed in Egypt, which were meant to make them believe in, believe in and trust in Hashem's ways being the best avenue for vitality and success, that all is being, or is going to be, for this part is prophetic and has not yet happened to the people, not yet settled in the promised land. All that they have seen at the time of their redemption has been, um, has been what they will experience because of their betrayal of, specifically, God's will, which is his Torah, lived out in their lives. In other words, the evil diseases of Egypt have or will come upon them because they became like those idolatrous, cruel, immoral nations. And our song continues with Devarim 32, 26 through 27. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces 
I will remove the memory of them from men, had I not feared the provocation of the enemy, that their adversaries would misjudge, that they would say, Our hand is triumphant, and the Lord has not done all this. This is a similar call back to the very argument, so to speak, that Moshe made as he advocated for the people upon their first transgression against the rock who bought them, ransomed them from Egypt by the slaying of the, of the firstborn of Egypt. It was that blood price which made the purchase. At that time, Moshe said to God, You know, you know what human history will pro proclaim of you? If you cut them to pieces and exterminate them in a moment, human history will claim that you never did all the things that you did for these people because A, there will be no remaining eyewitness to pass on this first-hand information, and B, that you had ill intent all along and were just like the other false deities with their legends, slinking lightning bolts if not properly appeased. This is how... The one soul God is different from all the non-gods. He is involved in a relationship with his people, and he has done all he has done, and will yet fulfill the promises he has made. Shemot, Exodus 32, 12-14 Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains, and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Avram, Yitzhak, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and all this land of which I have spoken I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Back to our psalm, sorry, our song, Moshe, Devarim 32:28-29. But they are a nation lacking in counsel, and there is no understanding in them. Would that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would discern their future. Again, we find at the end of this section of God responding to all Israel had done a plea from his heart. If only, would that can't my kids just see that I have their future in mind when I give them my ordinances, statutes, my judgments, and my entire perfect Torah? That it correlates directly to their future? That the way they behave now will continue to sing into their children's lives for generations to come? And verse 28 states that the nation is lacking in counsel without understanding. Is this the case? Do they not have Moshe? Joshua, other good leaders? They do, besides the fact that they have the Torah to inquire of and to seek counsel from. And this is the issue. But they have not sought the counsel, nor heeded the words of these good teachers or the Torah. I bless us to be able to attach ourselves to good leaders, counselors, and the Torah. And going on in our song, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, 30, and 31. How could one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, unless their rock had sold them, and the Lord had given them up? Indeed, their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves judge this. This verse is amazing. It is linked to another very challenging text in the Torah, which contains other stark, terrifying curses which a person brings upon himself through rebelling against Hashem repeatedly, intentionally. The context of Vayikra paints a picture of chaos, confusion, distortion, fear, mayhem, complete helplessness, much of which is not only self-inflicted, but also delusional. Let us bear this in mind for the times at hand. Our rock has not sold us out. Our rock is different from the images of stone, or the cathedrals of men, or the palaces of vanity, and riches, and power that they had believed in and trusted. But soon, Hashem will show, and they will recognize how very different the rock of salvation is than that which they had made 
their devoted thing. By Euchre Leviticus 26, 36 through 39. As for those of you who may be left, I will also bring weakness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a driven leaf will chase them. And even when no one is pursuing, they will flee as though from a sword, and they will fall. They will therefore stumble over each other as if from the sword, although no one is pursuing. And you will have to stand up before your enemies. But you will perish among the nations, and your enemy's land will consume you. So those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of your enemies. And also, because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will rot away with them. This section, the following, of promise is indeed this special relationship which we, which will allow for the rock to set us apart through this, through the wondrous provision and protection that the eyes of our enemies will witness. Once again, we have repeatedly seen, as we have repeatedly seen, the obligation on our part, the incumbent duty, or our terms in the agreement. Our responsibility to the covenant and covenant maker has everything to do with his Torah and its safeguarding through witness and remembering, through its fulfillment in our lives. Vayikra Leviticus 26, 1 through 13. You shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image or a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figure stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering, and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in the land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. So I will turn towards you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant with you. You will eat of the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, so that you would not be their slaves. I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. And so basically, before I pause for another section, because my computer's running out of battery, these things from our song, from this promise of consequence, where there will be chaos, and it'll be delusional chaos, and it'll be um, the case in which how could, how could a thousand put ten thousand to flight unless... God said, I'm not giving you that special protection anymore because you aren't living a Torah life. It is promised to not be that way should we keep these things in order to carry them out. And then in that case, it'll be that a hundred will chase ten thousand. And, um,. Hello, Koshem. We'll do another section and finish off this class.